welcome Ryan to the pulpit. Thanks, All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I don't know if we said it yet, but let me be one of the people to say happy uh, Labor Day tomorrow. Hopefully you guys all have a good time off. Uh, we're going to jump right into the scripture and then we'll do the message. So the scripture should be up there. It is should be on page uh, 1093. We're going to look at Romans 4. And we're going to jump in a little bit. We'll do the first eight verses and then we'll go to verse 18. So uh, this is the word of God. It says, what, shall, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness uh, of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whom, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord will never count against them. Amen. So I'm going to jump over now to verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakness in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the, the promises of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over, the dead, over death from our, for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Let me just pray uh, before we start here. Father God, just thank you for today. Thank you for this nice cooler day and even just feeling the, the nice breeze coming in here. Just thank you for every day you give us as a gift. Uh, just Lord, may we hear your voice through this message, through your word, uh, through what I share. Uh, and just thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here and to hear about your truth and how awesome you are. So we thank you for Jesus. And it's his name we pray. Amen. So some of you might not know, but my name uh, is Ryan Dewey, and I, and I used to be uh, a member here back in the day when I was in high school. My parents and family were here back in the day. And so whenever I come back, it's nothing but good memories and I always enjoy seeing how everyone's doing and, and sort of catching up a little bit. And also, you as a church, you might not also know, uh, is supporting me through the ministry of CREW. Uh, and again, CREW is basically a college ministry. It's a, it's a national slash international ministry. Um, and so I've been able to work at Buff State and work in the college campuses. So I'll share a little bit about that at the end. Uh, but just always thank you for the support and the prayers uh, and what you're doing. So speaking of high school, though, one thing when I think of my, my journey in the high school uh, days here at Knox is one thing we used to do uh, when I was in high school was we would go to these camps called Young Life Camps. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it, but Young Life is a national, also a national ministry, and they're really big on high school, a little bit of middle school, uh, like parachurch or ministries outside the church, but partner with the church uh, kind of things. And so what they do is they'll go into different areas where maybe uh, students might not be the most interested or uh, feel comfortable about going to a church, and so they'll try to make connections and start to share the gospel, build relationships. Hopefully through that, we'll start to see more students give their lives to Christ and start jumping in the church. What made it unique here, though, is that we were we were at Knox, right? So it was sort of a parachurch ministry within a church ministry. So we used to meet here and do the youth group thing down by the gym and, and the youth area. So every summer, though, we would have these big, big camps. And, and definitely, I, I've been in youth ministry and, and been to a bunch of retreats and trips. And, and Young Life camps, at least from what I've experienced, is probably like the Disney World of, of camps in terms of what they offer, uh, their food, their fun activities. 
And so one of the things that we did when we were there, we do things like biking and, and tubing and swimming. So a lot of fun and obviously the gospel would be shared there as well. One of the things that we did that I never did before when I was at one of the Young Life camps uh, up in uh, Saranac, New York, was we did a ropes course. And uh, I'm not, I mean, I do amusement parks from time to time and, and do some of the rides, but I'm not a big heights person, even though I'm tall. I'm, it's, it's more like the, you know, the fear of free falling. It's just, you know, who wants to do that at times? Some people might, but that's not me. So we basically walk up this hill and then basically it just sort of stops like this pulpit. It just stops and you see like a couple lines of like ropes and just going out into nothing, into air. And you're just like, okay, what is this? <laughs> right? Because you didn't know. And we're so oh, it's a ropes course. We'll just get some harnesses and here we go. And just like, again, never did it before. So I was just like, is this something people do for fun? It was really strange, really weird, but, but it is. Like, again, it's sort of a, it's a challenge and there's some team building involved. And so basically what they do is they harness you up and there's basically lines going through trees and some will be like zip line kind of things where you're moving. Others are more you're climbing and moving around or, or trying to go through obstacles. Uh, but definitely it was, it was not like first thought. It's like, I don't know if I want to just be hanging from the, from the, the sky here and, and cause you're up pretty good. I mean, I, I don't know the actual feet, but you're definitely up high. So again, I never did it before. And so for me, it was like definitely a little nervous, a little uncomfortable. And so my goal at first was like just to, to hold on to dear life to these ropes as you're moving and climbing around, you know. Uh, I still, I had my harness, but I'm just trying to hold on as tight as I can. Uh, and I actually, I slipped. And so I'm like freaking out, oh, you know, but thankfully the harness is there. And so it was actually the best thing that I slipped because again, I'm, I'm, I'm new at this. I didn't really know what was gonna happen. And so you're basically, you're sort of just sitting in your harness up in the air. And so that was good because at least I realized like, okay, I'm not going anywhere. The harness is connected to these ropes. It's nice and tight, even for a big guy like me. Uh, I'm secure, I'm safe. So I could let go and I would not go anywhere as long as my harness is connected. And so after that, I was still nervous. I would say like if red was like freaking out, I was probably like a yellow, you know, and then like green is good. So somewhere in between. Um, but I definitely, at least because I was able to sort of lean back when I slipped and realized I'm not going anywhere, I was able to finish it and, and do what I, I had to do, right? Uh, it's still not really my favorite thing to do. I've done a few of them. I've even gone parasailing where you're up in the, in the air. That actually I liked more because you're, you're sort of just in a swing ride kind of thing and you're just holding there where you don't actually really move. But I share all that to say that, you know, that I put my trust and my faith in the harness uh, in that moment, and it definitely helped me get through. And so today's message is about trusting God. And when I think about just this idea of trusting or what we put our faith in, it's funny, just like the ropes course, right? There's a lot of sort of daily activities or daily things we just sort of accept that are gonna happen or things that we trust that are gonna work or trust that we're gonna keep us safe. A couple that came to mind here for, uh, for me was like, you know, when we sit in a chair, when you're in a, sitting in your pew or sitting in a chair at home, we trust it's not going to break when we sit in it, right? We trust it's going to hold our weight and it's going to be sturdy. We never think twice. It's not like people are just sort of like testing it out at first and, and seeing what's going to happen. They're, they're, you just sit down knowing it's not going to break. And obviously there's once in a while those weird stories where something does happen or you fall over in your chair, but that's very few and far between. Uh, another thing I was thinking is, yeah, our cars, you know, hopefully for all of us, you trust, you'll turn the key, you'll push the button or whatever now, a lot of cars have buttons, uh, and you, you trust it will start, it won't break down on you, because obviously that's the worst if that were to happen. But you trust and believe that every time I turn my car on, it's gonna work, it's gonna drive, you're not you're gonna fly off the road. Um, a couple local flavors, right? Now you trust that pizza and wings will always taste good, you know, whenever you order it, you trust and hope that you'll never have bad pizza. And sadly, I've had bad pizza before, even in Buffalo, it's hard to believe. But, but uh, you, you know, usually you trust in order that your wings and pizza are gonna be good. And a new exciting one for all you Bills fans, right? This year, we're trusting and we're hoping that the Bills are actually gonna keep being good and it's not a one-hit wonder. So keep your fingers crossed on that one. I'm, as a diehard Bills fan I'm still sort of optimistic and what I mean by optimistic is actually the opposite like I'm, I'm like okay I don't know if this is really gonna be good are we really gonna be good this year again I don't know so there's that doubting right it's just from growing up being in the Super Bowl era but we're trying to move on right go Bills but anyways um, 
So yeah, you trust and you believe these things. So a lot of, you know, again, people who aren't even in church, a lot of daily routine kind of things that even if people say, I don't really believe in God, still have a faith, still trust and hope in something, still have like a reality they live in where they think things aren't going to break down and it's all going to be good. So then I flip to that. The other side of that is like, okay, well, what about God though? What is it like if you're not a Christian, why, why is it a struggle at times, especially with what I do with crew? We have a lot of these kind of conversations about, you know, do you believe in God? Do you trust God? What are your thoughts? And it is interesting how for a lot of people tr trusting in a God or, or the Christian God that we believe in, you know, it's always there's there's questions there it, even though it seems easy especially for us as christians to say you know you put your faith in god you believe in jesus that's all you have to do like it's that simple even though i know it's more complex than that but it really is just put your faith in god put your faith in jesus uh it's difficult and so my question I, i've been i'm big into philosophy at times and so my question is always like why right why why is it difficult for some people to just say can you trust in somebody else can you trust in a god and I think part of that reason that we, we struggle, or it's, it's more difficult for a lot of people, is because you are taking the power and the ability outside of yourself, right? So for a lot of us, uh, you know, we're, we're born in sin, we, we, you know, for all of us, but in terms of like we struggle with control or power, part of our sinful nature, sadly, wants to be in control, wants to be like God, wants to, to be able to, to move their lives in the areas that they want it to be, right? I'm there too, I do that too. I, I really struggle at times with wanting to see things happen a certain way or within my timing. And so faith can be like that too, where sometimes you're like, well, I'd rather try to work or, or do good things or, or, you know, have the power and the ability and not put my trust into somebody else in, instead of putting the trust in me. And, and that's the whole battle that we have as Christians, which I personally love in terms of Christianity doesn't hide it. They're basically like, yes, there is this battle with self. There is this realism that we wake up every day with, we have to make a choice where it's either, do I serve myself today or do I serve God? Uh, whether you're a Christian or not, I think there's still that battle within you, right? And so I love that Christianity just addresses that and, and talks about it. And Romans, I know we just read Romans 4, but Romans is, is covered with that kind of conversation about, you know, let go of yourself and know that sometimes we can trip ourselves up or be our own worst enemy. And so definitely when I think of trust, that can be a stumbling block because people, including myself, would rather have the ability to do it themselves, have that control. And also maybe there's some questions about, is God really trustworthy? And we'll get to that for sure in this message. But I think that's something that people think about, right? Uh, I know some family members that uh, they've lost loved ones. My mom's mom passed away when she was four. And I know some of her siblings have been, who were older, she was only four, yeah, she was only four years old, so, but some of her siblings that were older have always struggled with that sense, right? So, you, and I'm sure you guys have stories too where you, you lose a loved one and you do ask God why, or maybe you're like, I can't trust you, God, because this happened. That's a legitimate struggle that people have because they lost their mom so young. I don't, you know, you tell me God's good, but this happened, so what do I do with that, right? It's, it's a deep question, it's a deep struggle. Um, but so I can see that might be a reason too why people might struggle when they talk about trusting God and sort of what they put their faith in and what they believe. But hopefully, through time, through conversation, you could start to see some things that no, God is trustworthy. And, and even, I think, in this season we've been in, in this weird COVID season where we're sometimes we gotta throw masks on, it's like, there's hopefully for you, definitely there's been moments of, of think, not, not, not questioning, but like thinking about, okay, God, where are you in this? I know that's been the case for me. And how can I grow in my trust, right? How can I grow in what I'm trying to do? Because really in the scripture, we're gonna look at it again a little bit. It's, I think it's really through some of the struggles, some of the tough times that hopefully our trust will grow or at least it'll become built on something more foundational because when things are comfortable, when things are going well, maybe sometimes there is that desire or temptation to just coast through life and not really think about the deep questions, not really think about how much do I really trust God? How much are my actions also following how much like I believe. And so that's sort of something that's been in my heart through this season, through COVID and, and just the craziness that's been going on in our country and world and, and trying to say, yeah, how much 
do how I live and what I say reflect, you know, how much I really believe and trust in Jesus? And, and so hopefully that's been some of the questions you guys have been thinking through this season, through this time, because I don't think, one thing I've really been learning the last, you know, four, four to three years it's like, I don't think God wants us to be comfortable a lot. Like, I think sometimes comfort can be a tough thing. And, and we sort of stay, our faith, our faith can get a little stale. Where I think when we get uncomfortable or, or our faith is stretched, that's when we really start to say, okay, what do I really believe or what really matters? And so the reason I share Romans 4 is because I think Abraham is such a great example of that, right? Where here's this guy who God basically approaches and says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And he's hitting 100 years old. And he's like, well, I ain't, I ain't a dad yet. So what's going on here? And I was even thinking like, you know, how much did he struggle with that? How much was that like God kept telling him, I have this great plan, plan for you. Your children are going to outnumber the stars in the sky. It's always a great imagery, right? And yet I wonder how much he was like, well, I'm, I'm, it's another birthday and no more kids or no kids yet. You know, what's going on? And, and uh, you know, and, and definitely Romans 4 really hits, I think, a lot of where Abraham's heart is and, and a lot of sort of what he did end up putting his trust in, which is cool. And more so starting at verse 18. So I'll get to that in a sec. But let's, if you got your Bible still open, let's look at Romans 4, verse 1 to 8 again. Uh, and I just want to pick out a couple of key points that stood out to me when we talk about trust and when we talk about putting our faith in God. So again, Paul, Paul who's the author who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, who, who has a great story in itself, one of my favorite writers of the, of the New Testament. He's also, it helps that he re wrote the majority of the New Testament. But Paul basically writes about this idea of you know, what, what is salvation really? A lot of this, this early topic and, and is it, is it, we just do enough or is it, do we put our faith in God and what does that look like? So he uses a lot of everyday or, or old Testament, uh, stories that help us to understand. So he's using Abraham as an example here. So basically Abraham, he's saying is believing that God's going to do this, not just the thing with, with the fact that he's going to be an, an offspring is going to outnumber the stars, but just that God is faithful and trustworthy for his life, for his day-to-day -day things, for ultimately for salvation, for eternal life. And this is before Jesus was even a factor yet, right? This is before they even knew that Jesus was the Messiah, because we're talking Old Testament. But yet a lot of the Old Testament heroes of the faith would always just say, I'm going to put my faith in God and know that he's going to carry it out and he's the author of salvation. He's going to do what he does. And so Paul's basically saying, Abraham believed this in his heart. He believed it internally first. And that's why it was credited to him as righteousness. That's why it was basically saying he was putting his trust in God. It wasn't like Abraham's had to do something to earn this. Otherwise, it would have been more obligation, which is what Paul talked about in, in, in uh, verse 4. It wouldn't have been a gift, as we talk about a lot of times, whether it's during Christmas season, you know, the gift of salvation, or just sharing the gospel story. It would have been something he earned, but obviously God freely gave him this righteousness. Again, not based on anything Abraham had done. It was given to him. And that's why even it says in verse 2, like, if, if he had earned it, if this was something that he did, that he was trusting in himself, then he could have boast, boasted about it. He could have been like, look what I did. I, I helped 500 people across the street and I earned my way to God, right? Like he, he had nothing to boast in. The only person he had to boast in was God the Father who was giving him uh, the love and the compassion and these promises and ultimately eternal life. And so he had nothing to boast about in that. And we could say the same thing, that there's nothing good in us that we can boast in. But it's, we have so much to boast about who God is and what he's done for us and the gift that he gave us. And we know it's a gift because verses like this, Romans, just a quick side note, Romans was, was a book that totally changed my life when I was in college. We did a Romans Bible study with some of my buddies when I was at, at school and, and uh, totally changed my life in terms of what I believe in the foundation. And so a verse that says uh, from verse five, it says, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly. When I hear that, he's talking about us. Like, we are the ungodly. And I know sometimes we don't go as deep with our sin or our issues in church as we should. And so when you hear a verse like that, it's pretty clear. Like, okay, there is a struggle that humans have to not follow God, to walk away from him, to do the opposite of God, the ungodly things. 
But isn't that how cool the gospel is, though, that we have this backstory, and yet God still gives us love. He still gives us forgiveness. He still says, I'm going to send Jesus to die for you so that it will change your hard heart to be following me. And so when I started to realize in college that I was in that, I was one of the ungodly. It wasn't like, look at what I did, or look how good I can be, or I'm not a murderer, right? At least I didn't do that. When you start to see, no, I mean, even internally we fall short. Our hearts can deceive ourselves. Then you're like, man, I definitely need a savior. I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't trust in my own self because my self's going to fool me or, or, or tempt me or take me in directions I don't want to go. I need God's help to, to battle my sinfulness, to battle my ungodliness. And so when I read a verse like that, it's, it just hits you because that's probably like one of the biggest mysteries I still like wonder about and i remember hearing of a bible scholar like i forget who it was but someone just someone who's really smart and who basically was like someone asked him you know what's what is the one thing you would ask god or like what's the thing that still hits your heart or ponders you these days and he's like jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so and what he means by that is like just the fact that god would love any of us like the fact that god would forgive the ungodly the fact that god would help us through our trust issues is still a mystery, right? Like you could say, okay, maybe, yeah, obviously he loves us and he wants to share his glory with us, but there's still that like, but why God, why would you wanna do that? But hopefully it puts you in a place where you're like, but that's why you're so awesome because you would wanna do that, right? You would wanna, you would wanna give your love out to us. You'd want us uh, to accept your love even when we don't deserve it, right? So that's something definitely, when I look at God justifies the ungodly, it really hits my heart. And then hopefully when, when they quote the Psalms, when they're quoting David at the end of, of seven and eight, when it's just saying, you know, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins will never count against them. Maybe there's a day where you feel like you screwed up. You said something to somebody you shouldn't have said, or, or you fell into temptation or, or whatever it is. Your heart just is, feels off. I have those days too. And then you read a verse like this and you're like, praise the Lord that this is our reality, right? This is our truth, that it's not about the, what we've done. It's not about putting the trust on ourselves, which only leaves us depressed, which only leaves us unfulfilled, but it's putting our trust in Jesus who gives us life and hope and joy and, and, and the amazing truth of forgiveness that we don't deserve, right? That we don't deserve. And yet God gives it to us. And so hopefully verses like this hit your heart. I, one thing I feel like I've always been blessed, to, you know, just God has kept me accountable on is, is ever since my days in Knox, like God has just continued to hit my heart for the gospel to be melted and moved. And what I mean by that is like, I just hope when you read verses like this, like it just keeps hitting you. And it's not like I've been to church a long time and I hear about Jesus and I want to hear something else. It's like, no, man, like we have to always start and, and move from the gospel. Like I remember hearing from a theologian who says like it's, it's the, the pool that we swim in is the gospel when we talk about how we live and what we do. It's we always have to just be melted and moved by our hearts, by that truth. So I hope and pray when you hear about the fact that God saves us in spite of ourselves, that still hits your heart. That's still like if you've been to church for years, uh, hopefully if you're new, it's, that hits your heart for the first time because there's nothing like this story. This story is so unique that we have a holy God who's one of a kind who will die for unholy people. Like that's still something that even in this crazy world we're living in now, we can still shout from the rooftops and tell people and give them hope when so much of our hope has been taken away this, this season we've been in with COVID to know that we still have the ultimate hope that Jesus is real. And uh, Tim Keller, another theologian, basically said, the big difference between Christianity, which makes it so unique, and other religions is all the other religions basically, yes, they have differences, but to sum it up, they're basically saying, do this. You know, do these actions, try to be a good person, maybe you'll find paradise, maybe you'll, you'll be in eternal life. Um, you know, I think the Muslim faith, there's not really a guarantee unless you, you kill yourself. For Allah, it's pretty crazy, but... It's like you have to do these things. And yet Christianity says it's done. It's finished. Jesus did it. And all we have to do is trust in him. All we have to do is put our hope in him. It's finished. It's over. There's no work that we have to do. And even if there was, there would never be enough works we could do to, to get into a holy place because our sin is still there until we put our faith in Christ. 
And so I think that's just, just a great analogy, to do versus done, to know that our faith is sealed because of what Jesus has done. It's a guarantee. It's a promise we can trust because of what Jesus has done. He defeated death. He resurrected. And so hopefully you hear that too, to know that this, is, this faith is one of a kind. I know definitely for, for me, I, I want to be pursuing things that are different, that are unique. I don't want to blend in. I don't want to just do the same things everybody else does. And if so, if that's the case with Christianity versus every other religion, yeah, sign me up. Let's go, right? The other thing that I thought was really cool, I, I, I've been serving at my church uh, in, in the middle school youth group program. And so one message I did, this, this isn't my thing, so don't think I made this up on my own. I got from my curriculum I used, is uh, I'll repeat it twice, because I do believe this is a worthy quote to write down. So if you're gonna write down, write something here. Uh, it says, leadership is followership. I'll say it one more time. Leadership is followership. What that is saying, when you can look at what Abraham's about, and then you can start to reflect on our own lives, about trust and, and putting your faith in something is that I think the true leaders that really make an impact still follow people, still are about following somebody else, still have mentors, still have people they listen to. Ultimately here, big picture, Abraham is saying, I'm following God. I'm gonna be a leader of Israel, but I'm following God. So leadership is followership. And so we get that from these verses where he's saying, I'm not gonna to try to be the ultimate dad on my own. I need God's help in this. I mean, I'm over almost 100 years old. I definitely need God's help. But even if he was gonna to try to do it himself and like just try to get tons of people pregnant, it probably wouldn't have worked, right? So leadership is followership. He's trusting in God first. He's putting God first in that. So I just thought that was always cool just to think about that. Uh, you know, what, who do you follow? Who do you put your faith in when you try to be a leader in your community, within your family, with what you're doing? Is that something that, that is a priority for you? And again, all of this stuff I'm talking about, like one thing I was reminded when I was looking over this message and, and writing down notes before I came, well, not just before I came here, but you know, this whole week, is it kills your pride, right? Like talking about the boasting thing or talking about being a follower of others. So much of our culture is about self and let's, let's just be for num numero uno, just be about ourselves. And yet Christianity's like, you know, follow others, serve others, obviously ultimately follow God. Uh, you know, be humble and get rid of your pride, which I know can definitely stumble me at times. And so that's something I think is really cool, right? When you think about, you know, who's a good leader you want to follow or, or who you're putting your trust in. Are people putting their pride aside and trying to follow someone greater and obviously ultimately follow God? So leadership is followership. I thought that was a cool thing to share for sure. Let's jump back into the verses for a sec. Verse 18. I, I just love this wording. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so, and, and the verses go get even a little more blunt and just so, you know, say basically like he's a hundred years old. So like, you know, his the ability to have kids is, is dead. Like, it's like, whoa, that's, that's a blunt talk or, or Sarah's womb is dead. You're like, man. But yet, so like in reality, most people be like, dude, you ain't having any kids. You're like, you're a great, 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 great grandfather. What are you talking about? You can't have kids at this age, but it's like he, against all hope, he believed and trusted that God still had this promise, that God still believed. Uh, or he still believed in God that he would do it. And so I just love that it says that against all hope. And then the other part that I really thought was cool was from verse 21. It says, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And I think that's just a great reminder for ourselves. Do we believe like that, right? Do we have big prayers we're asking God and, and really believe that God has the power to do it. I know I don't always, just being real. Like there's times I feel like I, I limit my prayers or I make my prayers small when you're like, dude, this is the God of the universe. He can do anything. Shouldn't we believe that he can end COVID if he wanted to? Or shouldn't we believe he can heal somebody if he wanted to? Or shouldn't we believe that he can give you a job if you're looking out of nowhere because he's God and can do whatever, right? And so I, I think the heroes of the Old Testament or the heroes of the faith and the whole Bible we got it. We got to reflect that faith to be like, I believe no matter what, that God has the power to do this, that God has the power to, to do amazing things. And so I think that trust factor comes from that. That trust factor is, is just something that we need to make sure we have the whole perspective on when it comes to how big God really is, how powerful God really is. And so that's something that really hit me when I read this, like, man, you know, he was fully persuaded. Um, and even like, I think of, 
uh, you know, Isaac and Jacob too, right? Those, those kind of stories. He's fully persuaded that if if uh, Isaac died, that that he uh, would be able to be resurrected in that time. So you just see these bigger pictures where, yeah, man, there was a lot of faith that these men and women had back in the Old Testament and New Testament, trusting in who God is and what he did. And so definitely that's something I think just to reflect on ourselves, to be like, do we, do we trust God like that? Do we believe and live our lives like that for God? And the reason I'm sharing a lot of this is, again, you know, because of the season we've been in, I feel like this is just a theme that God has been putting in my heart, right? Like, do you trust me to still walk the walk even when we're still battling COVID in our world or to still walk the walk when, you know, you're, you're battling for financial support or still walk the walk when relationships go south and you're just trying to trust that God is there. And that's why I brought up a little bit of, you know, it's sometimes I think we grow more when we're uncomfortable. We grow more when times are tough because I think it's easy to be like, I trust you, Lord. I just won the lottery. I totally trust you, you know, kind of thing versus like, I trust you when our answer to prayer is no. I trust you when our answer to prayer is wait. You know, that's the kind of things I think as Americans we fight God on sometimes is we have to wait or we have to, you know, hear a no. And that's not the direction God wants for our lives. And I think this COVID season has helped me realize that more. It's like, you know, I want COVID to be over. And I think, you know, we've definitely been able to open up more, thankfully. But at the same time, it's still out there. And it's like, okay, we got to trust God when the answer is it's not over yet. And for whatever reason, it's not. But I know God's still in control. I know God's still on the throne. I know ultimately God's going to restore this world so we never have to hear about viruses again, right? Those are the truths and the promises that I put my faith in that I'm trying to walk each day. To say, even when I'm not feeling like, okay, what's going on here, Lord? I still have those promises to hold on to. I still can say, I trust you, Lord, because I know the end, end game. I know the, the big picture. I know who wins, and it's God, right? But I think at times, like I said, we get caught up because as Americans, we, we want it always to be yes. We want it always to be comfortable. We don't want to have to deal with struggle and pain. And then when you hear stories like Afghanistan, it, like, it breaks your heart, right? When you hear about the church and people dying for the faith and, and getting, you now people are going home to home looking for Christians, like scary stuff. But yet that's what God's calling the people of Afghanistan to right now. And so we as a church definitely need to be praying and I'll make sure we pray uh, when I close it out for them, for the Christians, because we have never experienced stuff like that, right? And so would you still be a Christian if people were hunting you down because you believed it? I mean, it separates the sheep from the goats for sure, right? Like when they know they're signing up and it is literally life or death when they say yes to God. And I think definitely as an American church, we've gotten way too comfortable with this whole year of complaining about things that we shouldn't be complaining about. When you look at the church in the Middle East and they are trying to fight to stay alive. Uh, it's, it, it wakes you up to a lot of things when you, when you see stuff like that or people trying to get, get out of an airplane just to get out of the country. It wakes you up to see stuff like that. So know that even through all that chaos, even through all the, the ups and downs of life, that God is trustworthy. That God is one that we can put our faith in. One other analogy I wanted to share with you as we close it up is uh, I thought about, uh, you know, shout out to a big movie fan. So I, sh I thought about uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So it's, some of you might not know, but some of you will. Back in 1989, it was a film. Uh, Harrison Ford played Indiana Jones. Sean Connery was his dad. Um, and those were like, when I think of films, like as an early childhood for me, like those, it was that and Star Wars were like probably the first two films I remember. Because uh, my parents had VHS copies for those kids who are not, don't, don't worry about VHS, you don't have to worry about it, it's gone now. But uh, anyways, um, there's a scene at the end, and I'll just do a little synopsis on the movie, but basically... Indiana Jones, he's used to being on his own, and what makes it unique about this whole film compared to the other two films, because there's two films before, is you know now his dad's in the picture, and so now he has to worry about his dad, and, and he's so used to just sort of taking care of himself. And the other side you start to see is that him and his dad, it's a distant relationship. They're not the closest. To him, his dad, he, I think he says it in the movie, like his, his dad cared more about old ar archaeological digs and, and the Holy Grail ultimately is the big MacGuffin in the film, the big thing they're trying to get to. And um, just they felt distant. Like, you know, you care more about these things than your own son who was here trying to get the father's love, right? 
And so fast forward to the end, and basically they, they find the grail in this old temple in the middle of the Middle East or wherever they're at, in some cool little location. And, uh, but they're not supposed to take the grail past the seal. It can only stay a certain spot, right? Uh, and the, one of the girls who's with them takes it and she crosses the seal and then just the whole temple starts to break apart. Eventually, like half of the floor caves in or breaks up and, and so she falls with the grail. She's trying to reach, the grail's like on a little ledge, a little ledge here. And so she's like hanging on Indiana Jones on one hand and reaching for the grail on the other. And all she had to do, all she had to do was give him her other hand, but she wanted that grail. And so her hand slips, sorry, spoiler alert, if you didn't see it, go check them. I might watch it tonight, check it out. Uh, her hand slips and she fell, falls to her death. But then part of the, the thing that Indy was laying on um, gave in too. So he now, he's based in the same position, he falls. His dad now is there holding his hand on one and then Indy's like, oh, I can almost reach it. It's almost here. Throughout the whole film, part of the comedy of the film is that uh, Sean Connery calls him Junior because he's, uh, his, his real name is Henry Jones Jr. and Henry Jones is his dad. But he likes to be called Indiana, which the, the, the comedy of that is, it's, I guess it was one of his dogs, so he was named after the dog, which is pretty goofy in itself. Um, but like he likes it. Like for me, I, I like to be called Dewey because that's my last name, but it's like it's got a cool ring to like my personality. So, so same nickname that he had. So this whole time he's calling him Junior. So again, he's holding on, I can reach it, I'm almost there. And basically in a, in a solid, um, you know, quiet tone, he's like, Indiana, his dad talking, Indiana let it go and once he said that there was this connection like okay my dad's opening up into my life he cares about me and he let he lets go of the grail and he grabs his hand and he realizes he cares more about his son than the grail i use an analogy to say when it comes to trusting God, I think times maybe we're reaching out for something else, right? We're reaching out for our own control or, or pleasures of the world. And God's calling us by na name. He's saying, let it go. Let it go. I'm here. Just give me your hands. And to know that it is life or death, right? And I don't just mean like eternal life with heaven, which is going to be amazing in itself if we accept Jesus. But, but if you truly want to live in this world, and I think experience trust and experience taking big steps of faith uh, you got to let go of things of the world you got to let go of some of our selfish pride you got to let go of the things that are going to stumble us up and so that's something that i'm telling myself hopefully you guys see that too and know that it is the better life jesus said i came to give you life and life to the full or life abundantly and again, I don't mean that, I don't think that means just for heaven. I think even in this world, how can we battle things like COVID uh, in eternal perspective and eternal trusting and, and living and walking our lives, trusting that God is going to be there for us. And even if tough stuff happens, you know, God's still there and we can still praise him from whatever location we're in or whatever situation or life circumstance we're in, we can still do it. So definitely god is trustworthy and the one thing when you look at the scriptures to, to close it close it out when you look at the scriptures you see just how much god when he says what he says he follows through and i mean I, I not only from the scriptures but i've seen that in my own life whether it's through crew or just the, my jobs you know different jobs i've had in my life or family things or relationships where well, god is god is in it right every step of the way and ultimately, we do know that we can trust God because of what Jesus has done. Because he already said, it's done, it's finished, it's over. I won. So trust in the winner, right? As Bills fans, trust in the real winner, which is Jesus Christ. That's who we need to trust to. So I think just some self-reflective questions for yourself when you head out is like, you know, do my actions represent how much I trust God? Am I afraid to take a big step because it's not comfortable? Or do I trust in the God who can do amazing things and big things in my life that you know, I never expected or will take me to places I never expected to go in a positive way or meet people I never expected to meet? Uh, I do believe God has great plans for us and whatever stage of life you're in, I still think he's not done. The fact that you're alive today means he's not done working with you on earth right now. And so I think he definitely has great plans for you. And so the hope, so the hope is that um, 
You know, God will, God will just do great things because we're putting our trust in him. We're, we're taking those steps for, further. And even just like thinking about as a church, right? Like one thing my church uh, raised to us a couple weeks back is like, what do people see when you walk outside or what do they hear when you speak? Do they see Jesus through you? Do they hear Jesus through you? Or do we get caught up in ourselves and just sort of, oh, they go to church, but they don't seem any different. Or they go to church and they don't have any hope in anything. They don't really trust. They're not taking big steps of faith. So why would I want to do that too? We have a witness that I think sadly the American church has really struggled with during COVID. I don't think we've really represented God the best. Uh, I think we've been too political and too much whatever, pick a topic versus just saying like, we're, we're here for Jesus. And so I think we definitely have a lot of work to do, but there's still work that can be done. And so trust in God with that, you know, definitely reflect on God's promises, both through the scripture, through the gospel and what Jesus did and your own life. Hopefully there's things where you saw God show up. And like I said, if it's a no or if it's a wait, that's part of our life. It's okay. You're not, not every prayer is going to get answered in this earth, but the one prayer that's always answered is Jesus, you know, that the gospel truth is always there. And so we can always start with that and then go from there with our hope and our trust. So I want to just give a little bit of time, maybe a couple minutes, and just, you know, give you guys a chance to respond to God, to God, a chance to just pray wherever you're at. Maybe you feel like I haven't been trusting you, Lord, with this season. I've, I've been too caught up in the, the social media or the news or, or where the bills are going to be or whatever versus to just stop and trust in you. So I want to give you guys a chance to talk to the Father who says, let it go. I'm here. Listen to me. So let me just give you guys that and I'll close it out in prayer. And then I want to just give you guys a quick uh, crew update. So let me pray. Or I'll let you guys pray and then I'll pray after. Father God, I, I just pray for everyone in this room, uh, wherever their hearts are at with you, I, I pray that you'll just break through. Whether it's those who've been devoted to you for years and continue to trust their promises, Lord, I pray that they'll just find hope and encouragement through this time, that they will continue to trust in you, continue to take even bigger steps of faith to know that you can do amazing things. And if it's a no or a way that they will trust in your timing or trust that you have something even better than what they thought. Lord, if it's someone in this room who doesn't know you, I just pray that uh, their hearts are moved to, to accept you, to put away selfish pride, to put away uh, their own direction, and know there's only one direction, which is following you. Again, help us be followers and not just leaders of ourselves. So I pray uh, with, for them just that they'll reach out to one of the elders here or reach out to one of the church members and just share that, hey, I, I want to follow Jesus. So I just pray that that'll be working in their hearts. And, and Lord, for whoever's in between, I just pray that you'll just continue to be doing a work in their heart, continuing to let go of self, continue to, to put trust on you and the greater things that you call us to. Help us as a church to, to be a witness for you and not a stumbling block. Forgive us as we have we failed this season for whatever things we've been a part of, whatever ways we've thought too much about ourselves and help us to be about your gospel, to be about your truth, to be about who you really are, uh, Lord. And, and yeah, help us to let go of things that don't really matter and to hold on with both hands to you. May we do that, Lord. Uh, and just, you are an amazing God. You are trustworthy. And we just thank you, Lord. Help, help our, our actions reflect what we believe internally. May you melt and move our hearts to your gospel and help us just put our trust 100% in you each day and it's in jesus name we pray amen so real quick uh, i wanted to just update you guys on crew so i mentioned uh, i serve at buff state 
uh, not too far from here. I've been serving there for about three years and love every minute of it. Talk about, you know, changing of a season, right? So basically last year, like most of us, we were online with a lot of things. And so to be able to be on campus and to actually see students and have students go to school uh, in person, like it's weird like to say, but it's one of the coolest things, right? Like we were so used to that as a norm, but now it, it feels special because it was taken away from us this past year. And it's like go back into the student union and see the retail dining and people interacting. And it was like going back to Disney World or something. It was just, it was so cool to be back there. So uh, we had our first weekly meeting last week, which is sort of our, our youth group kind of time with the college students. Had a great turnout, a good mix of students, both new and, and, and uh, our regulars. So definitely keep praying for the students of Buff State. Uh, they're all over the map in terms of what they believe. And we're just trying to share Jesus with them and bring them good community. Uh, and so definitely, you know, thanks for your prayers and for your support. Um, just a quick side note, I do have, I'll be out in the, the lobby area. Uh, I have a, a, a sign-up sheet. If you're interested, totally, you know, it's, if God's pulling it on your heart. Uh, we're, we're a mission organization, so basically we need uh, local support financially and through prayer. And so I actually did lose a couple supporters through COVID. Not, not because of like any serious things, but they were just they got people out of state that wanted to support some of their local things. So I could use uh, some financial support as well and help in this journey. And, and, I, and just a quick thing. So if you're a partner there, we basically update you on what we're doing. We share prayer requests or fun stories that God does through newsletters or videos. There's a newsletter uh, over in the missions bill area uh, of the church. So one of my old newsletters is there. But I also reach out to individuals. So if you individually feel like I want to support crew, I want to support Ryan, uh, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Or maybe you're like, I don't know much about crew, but I want to know more. Uh, we also impact international missions as well. Um, so I'll, like I said, I'll have a sign up sheet. Just take your name, phone number. We can follow up after uh, if, you're, if you want to be a, a financial or prayer partner. Uh, but even if, oh, even if you don't, um, please uh, just be praying uh, for the college ministries and what we're trying to do because, you know, God's moving and, and people are giving their lives to Christ. So excited about this semester. Literally, we just started, um, but would love to have more conversations with you guys back in the lobby there if you're interested. But thanks for your time. I think I'll head out here and uh, I'll see you next time. If anybody feels a need for additional prayer, there will be an elder up front after the service. Receive this benediction from 2 Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God and Father, who loves us and gives us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Go in peace. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great The lion and the lamb. How great.